ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯನ್ ಖರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ವಾಕಂ ಟು ಆರ್ ವೆಬ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಆರ್ ರೆಗ್ಯುಲರ್ ವೆಬ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಯಾಟರ್ಡೆ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಎಟ್ ಆರ್ ಶಬೋಧ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿಂಗ್ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯಸ್ ಆತ್ಮ ಬೋಧ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಲ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ವರ್ ವಿ ಲೆಫ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ ಅರ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಫಿನಿಷ್ಡ್ ವಿತ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ಇನ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ವಾಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೇನಿಂಗ್ ಹೌ ಆತ್ಮ consciousness consciousness is all pervasive now remember when we're speaking of consciousness don't let it be an abstract idea we're talking about the consciousness or awareness because of which you know what's happening right now because of which you see me because of what which you know what's going on around you in your room because of which you know what's going on in the room of your mind so to speak that consciousness which you think is ordinary which you might think is ordinary shankara here says is all pervasive and as we've discussed before consciousness your consciousness has no edge boundary limit no size no width therefore it has no boundary it has no limit that which has no limit is limitless all pervasive like space further if my consciousness is all pervasive and your consciousness is all pervasive they can't overlap what the rishis taught and what shankar is explaining in his verse 16 is that there is one all pervasive consciousness that becomes manifest or reflected wherever there is a mind so in the sec in the third line buddha eva of a bhaseta that consciousness of a bhaseta appears gets reflected buddha in the buddhi in the mind in the intellect in general wherever there is a sukshma sharira that sukshma sharira has a capacity to make all pervasive consciousness manifest or reflect that all pervasive consciousness shankara gives the example swachesu pratibimbavata like like light or like an image gets reflected in a mirror in the same way all pervasive consciousness gets gets reflected in in the mind wherever there's a shiny surface you can see your image not just a mirror any shiny surface can reflect your your image in the same way wherever there is a sukshma sharira a subtle body consciousness is manifest and that sukshma sharira is present in every living thing in this in this chair there's no sukshma sharira sharira the chair is not a living thing but think about a plant or a tree a plant or a tree is a living thing it has a sukshma sharira therefore consciousness is absolutely manifest inside that that plant or tree but there are certain limitations to the plant or tree um the plant doesn't have eyeballs hands and arms or a, or a complicated brain and because of the limitations of the plant or tree's physical form the the consciousness reflected in the sukshma sharira is manifest in a limited way just like if a human being had no eyes or arms or hands then the manifestation in that person would be limited think about or no brain you know some there's some birth defect where where only a portion of the brain is present so in someone who's born with that massive congenital uh, problem where they only have a minimal amount of brain present consciousness is indeed manifest reflected in that person 
but obviously it's going to be very limited in its manifestation. Okay. Now, uh, there, there's an extension of this metaphor. Shankara gives a metaphor of the mirror. Wherever there's a shiny surface, the uh, uh, image gets reflected. Another form of the same metaphor is, and some of you, uh, my longer term students, will have heard this several times already from me. It's a favorite metaphor, not my metaphor, but a, one that I like to use, and that is one sun shining on many, many pots of water. Each pot filled with water reflects the sun. If you look into each of those pots, you see the sun reflected. You see many reflections, but there is one sun. In the same way, there are many manifestations of consciousness in every living being, but there is only one consciousness. The basic metaphor is very nice, but it has some nice ways we can extend that metaphor. For example, we can distinguish between the bucket and the water it contains. The bucket represents our physical body, stula sharira. The water in the bucket represents the sukshma sharira, including mind. And that explains what happens at death. At death, it would be like a bucket springs a leak, a very old bucket springs a leak, all the water leaks out of the bucket. There is now an empty bucket. Does an empty bucket reflect the sunlight? Of course not, but look at this. Does the sun shine on an empty bucket? It does, of course. Remember our earlier discussion where I asked, is consciousness present in a dead body? Now you see the metaphor. Conscious, just as the sun shines on an empty bucket, but is not reflected because of the absence of water, in the same way consciousness is present even in a dead body, but is not reflected or manifest due to the absence of the sukshma sharira. And a last part of this, this metaphor, and, and I just, I love to extend metaphors. This one lends itself very much. And that is, suppose after the water leaks out of that old bucket, suppose that water gets collected and poured back in to a new bucket, a little bucket, a baby bucket. So the old water is poured into the new baby bucket and then suddenly you see the sun reflected in the new baby bucket. A sun is born, pun intended. <laughs> so it looks like, well look at this. Obviously this metaphor represents reincarnation. It looks like the sun that used to be reflected in the old bucket that same sun is now newly reflected in this baby bucket. But notice the sun didn't do anything. The sun did not travel from the old bucket to the new baby bucket. What traveled from the old bucket to the new baby bucket was the water that represents sukshma sharira, subtle body. As we discussed before, atma, as consciousness doesn't travel. We said before, consciousness is all pervasive. That which is all pervasive can't travel. It's already everywhere. How can it travel? So what travels at the time of death is not atma, consciousness, but rather the sukshma sharira, the subtle body. Okay, nice to, uh, oh, one more extension. When, this metaphor shows one more thing and we, we had discussed uh, several classes ago, if consciousness is one, then why don't, and same consciousness is present in my mind and your mind, why don't I know your thoughts? And we can explain it through this metaphor as well. Notice the ripples in one bucket, so the bucket has water, on the water are ripples, those ripples represent our thoughts. So the ripples in one bucket 
are different from the ripples in another bucket. The sun is the same, but the ripples are different. And one of those ripples is a thought that says, why don't I know your thoughts? As I said before, the question, why don't I know your thoughts, that question belongs to your mind, not to consciousness. Your mind is different from my mind. The ripples in one bucket are different from ripples in another bucket. Okay, enough of this uh, extension of the uh, prior, prior metaphor. We can now go on to verse uh, 17. Repeat after me, please. <clears throat> Dehendriya mano buddhi Dehendriya mano buddhi Prakriti bhyo vilakshanam Prakriti bhyo vilakshanam Tad vritti sakshinam vidyat Tad, vid, tad vritti sakshinam vidyat Atmanam Rajavatsada, Atmanam Rajavatsada. Here we have another verse where the words get jumbled quite a bit. So to unjumble these words, start in a third line. Vidyat, breaking the words apart. Vidyat, one should know, one should understand, one should understand what? In the next line, Atmanam. One should understand Atma, the true self. How should one understand Atma? That's what this whole verse is about. Back up now to the second line. Vidyat, one should understand Atmanam, the true self, consciousness, as being in the second line, Vilakshanam, different, separate. Separate from what? In first line, Deha, Indriya, Mano, Buddhi, Prakritibhyaha. Different from Deha, body. So understand Atma being consciousness to be different from, different from what? First line, Deha, body, Stula Sharira, Indriya, sense organs, part of Sukshma Sharira, Manas and buddhi, parts of sukshma sharira, and prakriti, prakriti byaha, different from all of these, prakriti nature, not just, consciousness is not just different from your body, mind, and senses. Consciousness is different from all material things in the world. This is our fundamental distinction between jada and chaitana. Jada, inert, chaitana, conscious, sentient. What is conscient or sentient is conscious or sentient is atma, and atma alone. What is jada is jada inert, is anything made of stuff. And as we differentiated uh, several classes ago, the difference between stula stuff, physical stuff, gross stuff, and sukshma stuff. We had uh, subtle stuff. We had stula bhutas, physical elements, and sukshma bhutas, subtle or non-physical elements. Anything made of elements, anything made of stuff is jada and therefore is different from consciousness. So, vidyat, one should understand atmanam, the true self, consciousness, to be vilakshanam, different from body, mind, senses, intellect, and the physical world around us. Then, the real essence of this verse is the, in the third line, tad vritti sakshinam. So you should vidyat, understand atmanam, atma, consciousness, understand consciousness as being tat vritti sakshinam, as being the sakshi, observer, witness, awareful witness. Atma is often called the awareful witness, the conscious observer. The very important word sakshi is used to, to uh, describe uh, at, that aspect of Atma. So you should understand Atma to be the Sakshi, to be the 
a wareful witness, the conscious observer of what? Tat vritti. Of vritti here is used in a, um, a general sense, activity. Vritti here means any activity. The activities of tat, of that, referring to the first half of the verse, the activities of your deha, body, the activities of your indriyas, senses, activities of your manas and buddhi, mind and intellect, and activities of the world around you, you should understand that consciousness, atma, is the awareful observer of them all, the consciousness, the witness of them all. Now, what's the significance of being a witness? And let's, let's ground this a little bit in our experience. Right now, your consciousness is the witness of whatever is happening in your mind. Right now, in your mind, many things are happening. One thing in your mind is you have an image of me in your mind, and you have my words that I'm speaking are present in your mind. Not only that, your own thoughts are present in your mind. Any questions or doubts or clear understanding that you have, it's all present in your mind. And any emotions that may come. I don't know if emotions will come during a class. Maybe you get a little excited when you understand something new. I used to feel excited like that. So all of your thoughts, sensations, and emotions arise in your mind and are observed by your consciousness, your consciousness which is the sakshi, the witness or observer of them all. Now the significance of that observation is this. The observer just observes. The observer doesn't do anything. Your thoughts are engaged in their various activities. So your thoughts go on changing. Your sensations go on changing. You see me now, you'll see something else later. Your emotions go on changing. All of these mental activities continually change. Are, they are involved in activity. All mental activities I'm being redundant. All, your, all these mental functions, thoughts, emotions, and sensations are constantly active. They're engaged in their individual activities. Here's a trick question. What activity is consciousness involved in? It's a trick question. To observe is really not an activity. It's very passive. A passive, and, and maybe we should add that word. Atma is not merely the conscious observer, but a passive conscious observer. A passive, awareful witness, that which observes without being involved in activities. And Shankara gives this wonderful metaphor to uh, show how this works. He says uh, that Atma is is tat vritti sakshinam. You should understand atma to be that passive, uninvolved, awareful witness of all the activities going on in your mind and all around you. So, and that atma is the last word sada. The at atma is the const sada always. Atma is the constant observer, the constantly present observer of all these mental activities and other activities. And, and here the metaphor comes, Rajavat. Many of you know Raja to mean king. Rajavat, like a king. And here with one word, Shankaracharya gives a very common metaphor. And I'll have to explain the metaphor. In the palace, all the ministers the king, the king is present in his palace, along with all the ministers. All the ministers are taking care of the business of the kingdom. Taking care of finances, taking care of the army, taking care of the people, all of that. The king doesn't do all that work. All that work, the organizational work, the, in American English we call it grunt work. The work of peons. 
Anyway, all that work is done by the ministers. What does a king do? The king sits in his singhasana, in his throne, and he doesn't do anything. He just sits there. In the presence of the king, this is the metaphor, and I know that usually kings are really involved in activities, but this is Shankara's metaphor. We have to understand it as Shankaracharya intended. What he wants us to understand is this. The king himself does not directly get involved in any of the details of running the kingdom. The ministers are involved in all the details of running the kingdom. But here's the point. The ministers only do their work in the king's presence. In the presence of the king, the ministers do their work. If the, I, I don't know how these ministers are. If the king were on vacation, on holiday, if he left the palace, maybe the ministers wouldn't be working so diligently. We don't know. But definitely when the king is present in his throne, the ministers will be very diligent in carrying out all, those work, all their work. In the same way, in the presence of consciousness, your thoughts are active. Your sensations are active. Your emotions are active in the presence of consciousness. So, con And the point is, is that as the king is not directly involved, the king is passive, the passive observer, in the same way consciousness is not directly involved in all of your mental activities. Very specifically, look at this. You decided to watch this class. Who decided? Did consciousness decide or was that decision a mental activity? Look at that. Decisions are mental activities. That are, do you know that you decided to watch this, uh, this class? Sometime before the class came, uh, started, you decided, oh, let's watch uh, Swami Taratmananda's class. You made that decision. You were aware of that decision. The decision took place in your mind, and you, as the consciousness, as the passive, awareful observer, you were aware of that decision made in your mind. So this is very surprising that consciousness doesn't do anything. <laughs> when I say that, I'm reminded of a joke that my guru, Puja Swami Dayananda, used to say, that which doesn't do anything is, is he said, good for nothing. <laughs> consciousness is good for nothing. It can't do anything. It doesn't need to do anything. In the presence of consciousness, everything takes Place. And that's going to be brought out more, actually two verses. I think we'll get to that verse in today's class. Beforehand, let, yeah, let me introduce the, uh, the next verse by raising the doubt you may have, and that is, it certainly seems like your consciousness made a decision. It seems like that. It feels like that. You have the experience of making a decision, the decision to watch this class. So before we address that, please remember our earlier discussions about how experiences fool us regularly. The sun does not go down. The earth turns on its axis. This chair is not absolutely solid. It's made of atoms which are almost entirely empty space. Experience fools us. And your experience of deciding to watch this class, that experience can also mislead you. And that confusion is taught very nicely in the, uh, in the next verse by Sri Shankara. Repeat after me. 
Vyapratheshwindriye Shwatma Vyapratheshwindriye Shwatma Sorry. Vyapari Vavivekinam Vyapari Vavivekinam Drishyate Breshudhavatsu Drishyate Breshudhavatsu Dhavan Hivayatha Shashi Dhavan Hivayatha Shashi The words are all run together again. Vyapratheshu indriyeshu. Indriyeshu. When your senses, and along with your body and mind, so indriyeshu, when your body, mind, and senses, vyapratheshu, when they are engaged in various activities, when your body, mind, and senses are engaged in various activities, then atma, the true self, consciousness, which is the sakshi, the passive, awareful observer, that consciousness, when the body, mind, and senses are active, atma, which is not active, not involved in those activities, what about that atma? Vyapadi Eva. Again, breaking up all the words. Atma Eva seems to be Vyapadi, engaged in various actions. When the body, mind, and senses are active, Atma seems to be involved in all those activities. Avivekinam. For those who lack Viveka, Viveka, discernment, for those who lack proper understanding. Those who don't understand properly <laughs> are confused, but a particular kind of confusion that we've already talked about, we called it superimposition. So superimposition, remember the orangeness of the cloth? get superimposed on the clear crystal. We've had this discussion before. In the same way, the activities of your body, mind, and senses get superimposed on consciousness, which is not directly involved in those activities. It's not hard to make that mistake. It's pretty easy to make the wrong conclusion that this is a, an orange crystal. In the same way, it's easy to misinterpret your experience, in particular, to misinterpret your experience of deciding to watch this class. It's easy to make the mistake and attribute the decision-making to consciousness, when in fact, Decision-making took place in your mind. Decision-making, as we said, it's a mental activity, and that mental activity is revealed by consciousness. Consciousness, which doesn't act, reveals the actions of your mind, including the decision. And here Shankara gives another brilliant metaphor. Almost, as we said in the introduction, almost every verse gives a, a, a nice metaphor. Here we have another one. Um, in the last line, yata, here's a metaphor. Remember in Sanskrit, drishtanta. Drishtanta is metaphor. Comes in the last line, yata, just like shashi, the moon. Before I give you all the words here, have you ever had this experience? It's a little strange experience. If you're outside at night, looking up in the sky, and the sky is about half covered with clouds, and those clouds are moving. The clouds are driven by the wind and are moving across the moon. So the moon is sometimes obscured by the moving clouds, and sometimes in between the clouds, you see the moon. The clouds are moving and the moon goes on shining. There's an optical illusion. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I have. 
It's an optical illusion that you look up and it looks like the moon is moving, not the clouds. It's an optical illusion. The clouds are moving across the moon, but something about, you know, know, it's the same, pardon me for being a little detailed, it's the same thing with the sun. Our minds, our brains are wired such that big things don't move, small things move. Our brains are literally wired with that information. Big things don't move, small things move, which is why the huge horizon doesn't seem to move. The sun, which only looks this big, that sun seems to move. The sun is small relative to the horizon, therefore we have that optical illusion. The smaller sun moves relative to the bigger horizon, optical illusion. Same when you look up at the sky. The clouds fill the sky. The clouds are huge. The moon is small. So when you look at the clouds moving across the uh, moon, because the clouds are bigger than the moon, it gives rise to this optical illusion that it's the smaller moon that's moving. Of course, the moon (laughs) doesn't move, but we get that impression. Nice how it shows one more example about how our experiences fool us. Your decision to watch this class, don't misunderstand that experience. The decision took place in your mind, the activity of of decision making was an activity of your mind and that activity was just revealed by consciousness. Just like the unmoving moon reveals the activities of the clouds, reveals the movement. The unmoving moon reveals the motion of the clouds. In the same way, your unchanging consciousness reveals the activities of your mind. But just as the motion of the clouds gets wrongly attributed to the moon, in the same way, the activities of your mind get wrongly attributed to consciousness. This is the central, this is the central problem of why we suffer. Let me just see how, how we're doing with time. So we are about halfway through the class, so we have plenty of time. So this is really the central problem. When we attribute activities of our mind to consciousness which has no activity. So again, the metaphor here, the moon doesn't move, but it looks like it's moving. It's an optical illusion. We attribute the motion of the clouds to the moon, which is unchanging. Problem of superimposition. Just like you attribute the orangeness of this cloth to the crystal, which is absolutely clear. Now, in the case of the moon or the crystal, there's no harm caused. When you, when you think the moon is moving, it doesn't cause any harm. If you think this is an orange crystal, no harm is done. But when you attribute activities of your mind to the consciousness, which is your essential nature, that's the root cause of suffering. Let me explain why. Your body and mind, senses, everything is imperfect and, let's face it, constantly decaying. Fortunately, it's not you. We, did, we went through this, this very simple discernment early on when we said you are different from anything you observe. If anything you observe is not you. If you observe a chair, 
The chair is different from you. When you observe your body, you are different from your body. When you observe your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, you as that consciousness, the conscious observer, Sakshi, the awareful witness, you are different from anything you observe. And that's really, really good news. Because if, <laughs> look, look at how silly this is. If I observe this chair, and suppose I have this lack of discernment. We said before, discernment means to know that anything you observe is different from you. Suppose I lack that discernment. I observe this chair, and I fail to discern the fact that it's different from me. Silly, I know, but you get the metaphor. So if the chair then, which, is, which I observe, if the chair has a broken leg, and chairs can have a broken leg, if this chair has a broken leg, I observe it, and I fail to discern the difference between me, the observer, and the chair being observed. In the absence of proper discernment, the chair has a broken leg, and what do I conclude? I have a broken leg. Now that sounds silly, that sounds absurd, but we make that mistake regularly. I observe this body. Suppose the body has a broken leg. I'm fine, don't worry. <laughs> but if the body has a broken leg, the broken leg belongs to whom? The observed body or the observer? The problem belongs to the body, not to the observer. And if the body has a broken leg, well, I should go to a doctor and get it treated. But there's no problem for me, consciousness. The observer is fundamentally separate and unaffected by what it observes. If this chair has a broken leg, how does that affect me, the conscious observer? If this body has a broken leg, how does that affect me, the conscious observer? Suffering comes when that discernment is absent when we identify with the body, mind, and senses. So if I lack that discernment, that discernment that says anything observed by me is separate from me, in the absence of that discernment, I observe my physical body, I get identified with the physical body, so there's no distinction between me and my body. There's no point where I end and body begins. They're one and the same. Then in the absence of that discernment, if the body has a broken leg, I have a broken leg. And if I have a broken leg, I suffer. If the butler, and we, we used this uh, teaching before, this is my guru's teaching. If in the absence of discernment, if the leg is broken, I have a problem, a problem that makes me suffer. In a presence of discernment, if the body has a broken leg, I have a situation that needs to be properly handled. This is my guru's distinction between problem and situation. A situation is something you deal with objectively. You take care of it. You do what needs to be done. A problem is something that threatens you and makes you suffer. If the broken leg belongs to the body, it's a situation that I can take care of. If I have a broken leg, I'm, I suffer. You get, the, you get the point. And this applies not just to the body. More, maybe more importantly, it applies to our mind. And in particular, the best example, sadness. Sadness belongs to the mind. Sadness is like a color. Just as, as, as this 
clear crystal can be colored by orangeness, your mind can be colored by sadness. Definitely. Of course, the color is probably not orange. It might be black with some other dark color that represents sadness. Here's the point. Orangeness belong, clearly belongs to the cloth and not to the crystal. In the same way, sadness belongs to your mind and not to you, the conscious observer, consciousness, atma, sakshi, the wearful witness. In the absence of discernment, though, we get into trouble. In the absence of, di of discernment, you think that it really is a, an orange crystal, which, as I said before, is harmless. But in the absence of discernment, if you think that the sadness in your mind, the sadness belo that belongs to your mind, is your sadness. So it's not that the mind has sadness, it's, I am sad. How different those statements are. Sadness is present in my mind is a statement of fact, an objective statement of fact. Sadness is present in my mind. To say, I am sad is a wrong conclusion due to the absence of discernment, viveka, this verse says in the second line, avivekinam, for those who lack viveka, for those who lack discernment. In the absence of discernment, I will conclude, I am sad. It's the equivalent of concluding that the orange, I'm sorry, that the crystal is orange. It's a wrong conclusion due to lack of discernment. In the same way, I am sad is a wrong conclusion due to lack of discernment. Clearly, this is the root cause of suffering. Not act actually, the root cause is ignorance, but the, but the active cause is this confusion, what we called superimposition, we, as we discussed before. Okay. We'll see one more verse today. Atma Chaitanya Mashritya Atma Chaitanya Mashritya Dehendriya Manodhya Dehendriya Manodhya Svakriyarthe Shuvartante Svakriyarthe Shuvartante Surya Lokam Yatha Janaha Surya Lokam Yatha Janaha Good. Another metaphor, Drishtanta. Start in the second line. <coughs> in fact, we had a similar, uh, similar expression before. Yeah, two verses back, we had Dehendriya Mano Buddhi. Here we have again Dehendriya Mano, but instead of Buddhi, it just has Dhi. Buddhi and Dhi are synonyms. Deha, body, Indriya, senses, Manas. Manas becomes Mano due to grammar rules. And Dhi which is buddhi, intellect, and it has a plural ending here. So deha, indriya, manas, and buddhi, all of these, in the uh, third line, swa, kriya, arteshu, vartante. So the body, mind, and senses, and intellect, vartante, are engaged in swa, Kriya Arteshu. They're engaged in their own individual activities. Swa, their own individual. And Kriya activities, Arta, for the sake of doing their own activities. So your body is engaged in its activities. Your senses, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch are engaged in their activities. Your intellect is engaged in activities. Your mind, like emotions, are engaged in various activities. All, all of these, deha, 
Deha, Indriya, Manas, and Buddhi, all of them are engaged in their individual activities, but not without consciousness. In the absence of consciousness, there is no sentient being. There's no life. There's no there's no sentiency. I don't know a better English word for it. There's no sentient being, no sentiency in the absence of consciousness. So therefore, the body, mind, and senses are engaged in their various activities in the first line and ashritya, dependent upon atma chaitanyam. Chaitanya means consciousness. Chit means consciousness. Chaitanya means consciousness. So the Chaitanya, the consciousness which is Atma. Atma Chaitanya means the consciousness which belongs to Atma, the consciousness which is the essential nature of Atma. So the first three parts of the verse, first uh, uh, three quarters of the verse, Shankara says that your body, mind and senses are engaged in their various activities only because of the presence of consciousness. Now, it'd be nice, you know, uh, Shankara gives a traditional metaphor here, but let's, let's go back to uh, a modern metaphor I gave uh, a couple of classes ago where I talked about the uh, computer. Remember, a computer has hardware, just like you have hardware, called stula sharira, in the same way your computer has hardware. Similarly, your computer has software, just as you have software. We call it sukshma sharira. Remember those 17 elements? I won't go through all of that again. Those 17 elements, your powers of action, your powers of, of uh, perce your perceptual powers, um, your, um, I, what am I, your prana, your life force, your mind, your intellect, all these 17 factors, all constitute your sukshma sharira, a subtle body which enlivens your physical body just as software makes a computer work. In the same way, sukshma sharira fills your physical body with life. But you remember the, uh, the key point of that metaphor. Your computer hardware and software won't do a thing unless you plug it in and turn it on. The computer relies on electricity to function. The computer's hardware and software only function in the presence of electricity. In the same way, the activities of your body, mind, and senses, these activities can take place only in the presence of consciousness. Fortunately, consciousness is all pervasive. So it's impossible to have your body, mind, and senses away from consciousness. But the point is, is that the activities, and what Shankara is, is saying here, the activities, the, let me say, conch, the intelligent behavior, this works nicely, the intelligent behavior of your body, mind, and senses is due to the presence of consciousness. Just as the intelligent behavior of your computer, hardware and software, is due to the presence of electricity, in the same way the conscious behavior of your body, mind and senses is due to the presence of consciousness. Obviously Shankaracharya could not have used this computer metaphor. If he lived today, maybe he would, I don't know. So he gives a uh, very traditional metaphor here. So body, mind, and senses are engaged in their different activities due to or depending upon the presence of consciousness, which is Atma. And he gives the example in the, in the Drishtanta, the metaphor in the last line, yatha, just as janaha, people, just as people, and you have to bring in the word vartante from the, uh, and svakriyarteshu, bring down, uh, I'll spare you the, the details of Sanskrit syntax. 
Anyway, we have to borrow some words here. So just yata, just as janaha people, vartante are engaged in swakriya arteshu. People are, in, are engaged in their own activities. Just as your body, mind, and senses are engaged in their individual activities, and the metaphor is just like people are engaged in their activities. Well, your body, mind, and senses are engaged in activities depending on consciousness. The metaphor Shankara gives is people are engaged in activities in the presence of Surya Alokam. Alokam means light. Surya, you probably know, means sun. The surya Alokam means the light of the sun. So people are engaged in various activities due to the light of the sun. If there were no light whatsoever, People couldn't be engaged in their various activities. This is a metaphor for how your body, mind, and senses are engaged in their activities due to the presence of consciousness. Now, if you're thinking, wait a minute, people can be engaged in their activities in the absence of the sunlight in the presence of a fire. Well, I don't know, maybe Shankara understood a little bit more of science than we give him credit for, you probably know, or you've probably heard, that everything on this planet depends on the sun. Life on this planet couldn't exist in the absence of sun. Because of the sun, all life exists on this planet in fact, even the oxygen we breathe comes from the sun. Did you, did you ever learn this? Very odd. Where does oxygen in our, we, our, we require oxygen to live. Where does that oxygen come from? Well, a, I think two billion years ago when the earth was about half of its present age, apparently these little uh, one-celled, Animals, uh, like plankton, they, they, were, they, they were critters that lived in the water, critters that would take in, critters meaning cells, cells that would take in sunlight and give off oxygen. That's where the oxygen we breathe comes from. Even the oxygen we breathe comes from the sun. Everything, when you burn wood, for light, for fire, where does the wood come from? Trees? Could the trees have existed without the sunlight? If you, if you just scientifically analyze everything that lives on this planet, all life exists due to the sun. How much Shankara understood that, I'm not really sure, but it's absolutely a fact. Everything. All life on this planet exists because of the sun. With that in mind, Shankara is saying that Janaha, all people, Svakriyarteshu Vartante, are engaged in their various activities, Surya Lokam, due to the light of the sun. You can take it in a very topical way that you need light to function, or you can take it in this more scientific way. Oh, everything is based on the sun. But here, that sun is a metaphor for consciousness. Just, a, just as people are engaged in their activities, supported by the light of the sun. In the same way, your body, mind, and senses are engaged in their various activities due to the light of consciousness. Metaphor. Consciousness isn't light, but we say the light of consciousness. Why do we call light, why do we say light of consciousness? Because consciousness reveals. Just as the light of the sun reveals all the activities that people are engaged in, in the same way, the light of consciousness reveals all the activities of your mind, all your thoughts, emotions, sensations, etc. One last point. 
body, mind, and senses are made of elements, both sthula bhutas, physical elements, and sukshma bhutas, subtle elements, which means what you're looking at is a pile of inert stuff. Fact. Body, mind, and senses. It's a pile of inert stuff. Just like your computer. <laughs> Hardware and software. Inert stuff. But when electricity runs through your computer, all that inert stuff, hardware and software, behaves in an intelligent manner. In the same way, due to the presence of consciousness, all of this inert stuff, body, mind, and senses, is engaged in intelligent behavior. It's the presence of consciousness that allows inert stuff to function in intelligent ways. Okay, enough. We'll continue our class next week. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchadduhka Bhagbhavet Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Hamratangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tat Sat Thank you.